afternoon. Um, it has been a tumultuous decade for Islamism around the world. Uh, the scene is unrecognizable in contrast to 10 years ago. We've had changes in the Gulf. We've had the collapse of Islamist branches such as the Muslim Brotherhood in places such as Egypt, but also North Africa and elsewhere in the Middle East. And we've seen the ascendancy of new Islamist movements in South Asia, in the Far East, and the changing and the balance of power of Islamism in Africa, and a growing problem in South America. Everything is changing. And as a result, there have been concomitant and independent changes in Western Islamism, especially here in the US. And understanding the details of Islamism matters. It really matters. It helps us understand especially with changing demographics in places like Europe, it helps us understand what kind of Islam uh, European Islamism will produce. In the US, where American Muslims are a far smaller proportion of the population, it helps us understand what the Islamist component of American Islam will do, how it will behave, how it will act, whether it will be pernicious, whether it will embrace violence, whether it will moderate and reform. The details matter. Everything is changing right now. Um, in the West. We're seeing a topsy-turvy uh, series of events take place. Most extraordinarily, um, we've had in the last few years a clear shift in the movement of monies. Once everyone spoke of Saudi or Qatar or various other Sunni Islamist states funding Islamists in the West. Now it's the other way around. Money goes from the West to the East. It's not just money, ideas as well. The West now exports ideas to the East. Islamists in the Middle East and South Asia send their children to American Islamist seminaries here in the US using generous F1 visa programs to do so. Just now, uh, or at least a few months ago, Anwar Ibrahim was elected Prime Minister of Malaysia. This man is a graduate of American Islamist circles. In fact, his closest advisors, his, his, the organizations in Malaysia with which he works and the agendas that he is imposing upon Malaysian society are American Islamist agendas thought up in the halls of think tanks in Virginia, just a few miles from here. So everything is changing and as the Islamist, the nature of the Islamist threat evolves, um, so too must the counter Islamist response. And I have with me two experts and colleagues uh, from two different organizations who are thinking about these topics, as are we. And I'm sad to say that with the growing uninterest in Islamism in the media, uh, among m too much of the public, that I, I think between the three of us, we represent the last of the counter-Islamist organizations in the United States. And our general feeling, although I'll have to see what my two guests say, is that the threat has not lessened. And yet, the number of people, the number of groups prepared to identify, to examine, to challenge this threat is very much in decline. Um, so I would like to discuss the changing nature of American Islamism and what we must do as the counter-Islamist movement pretty much in this room today, uh, how we can best respond to these changing uh, uh, affairs. Now, I have with me Abha Shankar on my right, uh, head of research at the Investigative Project on Terrorism. I've worked with ABBA for, for many years, as have many of the Middle East Forum. And on my left, we have Kyle Scheidler, who is, Scheidler, sorry, who is with the Center for Security Policy, and once again, an old friend of the Middle East Forum and someone with whom we've worked very closely. Um, we'll talk about some of these subjects, and then we'll move fairly briefly on to audience questions, uh, as I anticipate quite a few, and we don't have a huge amount of time. So as ABBA and Kyle talk, please do start writing your questions down, and someone will collect and, and bring them to me. ABBA, I would love to start with you. Tell us, what are your thoughts about the future of American Islamism and our response? So thank you, Sam. Um, so what I want to say is that um, the new trends that I've seen, and especially in the past few years, uh, Islamists have increased their attacks against India and Kashmir. And uh, India has become like the new Israel. And uh, for the past several decades, Islamists have been using a well-funded, a well-oiled you know, propaganda machine to target Israel. And that pre-programmed rhetoric is now being used against India. Um, labels that are used against Israel, such as settler colonialism, occupier, apartheid state, 
are now being used in the context of India. Hindutva, which is Hinduism that resists, that arose in the early 20th century as a pushback to political Islam and Muslim appeasement, is now being attacked alongside Zionism. The right to Jewish self-determination in their ancestral land as Nazi, as a fascist ideology. All this while Islamist radicalization and uh, terrorism continues to flourish in the Middle East and South Asia. The Islamist agenda is clear. Destruction of Israel, the world's only Jewish state, and the establishment of Ghazwai Hind, which is establishment of Islam in India. What are the challenges to counter inst Islamism institutes like ours? Uh, so I have here just a brief um, overview of what the challenges are that confront us. And um, the Islamists have been uh, very successful in marketing and branding themselves as civil rights groups and um, framing the whole Palestinian and Kashmir issue in human rights terms. And it gets hard for us to you know, counter that narrative because when you talk about human rights, it resonates very easily with the average person on the street. So that is definitely one challenge that we confront. The second one is, of course, uh, Islamist building of broad-based alliances with um, the far left activists and progressive groups. And um, for uh, some of you who were here yesterday, Astra did speak about that and she referred to it as the Red Green Alliance that is um, destroying our democracies and uh, destroying uh, societies. So um, the Islamists have been able to um, conflate you know, the Palestinian Kashmiri struggle, so to speak, with the liberation struggles of indigenous people around the world. Um, uh, we also see a rising influence of uh, Islamist groups in politics. And uh, we are seeing groups like CARE, American Muslims for Palestine, groups that we monitor at the investigative project. They have uh, increased their uh, advocacy against um, um, advocacy for sorry uh, the B, for BDS and um, overturning the IRA definition, which is the um, you know uh, the working definition of anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition that was embraced by the State Department in 2016 and has been endorsed by a number of uh, governments around the world, as well as international institutions. So they are pushing to overturn this definition of anti-Semitism. And then, of course, calling for an end to US and Israeli aid. We've also seen in the context of India a number of anti-India resolutions being introduced, um, and uh, also both at the federal and the city levels, you've seen um, in 2020, I think six uh, US cities passed anti-India uh, resolutions regarding the Citizenship Amendment Act, which was actually the humanitarian legislation to um, fast track the citizenship of, uh, um, of uh, minorities persecuted in Islamic countries around India, that is in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, we are also seeing the Islamists kind of uh, collaborate very closely with uh, Islamist countries such as uh, Turkey, Qatar, um, Pakistan, and as you mentioned, um, Sam, Malaysia as well, which you and I have done a lot of investigations on. And uh, also, many of uh, these issues like the Palestinian conflict and the Kashmiri conflict, they have a very complex history. And they're very nuanced. And uh, Islamists use public ignorance about these conflicts to put their own spin on the narrative. 
and uh, to spread their misinformation and propaganda. And that gets very hard to counter. So this, in a sense, is uh, you know, some of the challenges that we face. And I'd be happy to discuss this further in the discussion. OK, thank you. Uh, Kyle. Uh, so when I started in this business as an analyst, I was given only two rules. And the first is, if you're not Daniel Pipes, don't try to predict the future. And the second is, if you don't know the answer, try to figure out what the questions are. And so I will tell you up front that I don't know what the future of Western Islamism is. Uh, but I have some ideas about what kinds of questions I think we need to be asking uh, if we're going to try to figure out what a possible spectrum of futures might be. So I would propose we look at Islamism along two axes. Uh, the first axis would be a non-state, state actor axis. And this is the question really of who, in, who is influencing whom. Are non-state Islamist groups influencing states? Or are state actors using Islamist groups to achieve state level objectives? Uh, and the other is uh, an axis, uh, I think of it as sort of a Cold War polarity. You know, Islamism was partially founded as a third way between East and West, a third way between capitalism and socialism, uh, maybe in domestic terms, more crudely, a, a way between right and left. And where are Islamist groups on that spectrum? How are they, how are they dealing with the polarization in the West on, those, uh, on these issues? Um, and I don't have answers on these questions, but I think if we start to look at what, were the, what are the trends or what were the trends, maybe it'll give us an idea of where we would go. So on the non-state state actor question, I would, you know, I would look at a, a point of dominance for the non-state trend would have been the late 60s, early 70s in America, where you had the Muslim Brotherhood really establishing their network, really establishing institutions. And if you look at their documents at this period, they're mostly hostile to foreign, act, uh, to foreign states. They're mostly worried about governments being infiltrated by governments, uh, and they're trying to establish something, a kind of counter-state influence of networks and institutions. And that starts to change um, as we go into the, to the late 20s, uh, the aughts, right, uh, with, with, a, with a really high point at the Arab Spring. At the Arab Spring, obviously, you have you know, the, really the height of some of these institutions and networks in terms of influencing state actors. But at the same time, with the failure of the Arab Spring, you have the ascendance of state actors in Islamism. Uh, I mean, obviously, you always had some state actors. You had the Saudis, obviously, big funders and stuff. But even during that period, the, the, the Islamists were, were build, they were using Saudi money to build networks of their own for their own ends. And the Saudis found this out very uncomfortably during the Arab Spring. But after the Arab Spring, you have a real uptick in Turkish influence, Qatari influence, Pakistani influence, where these networks, once operating for their own ends, are now operating really explicitly for the ends of these states. Uh, a moment that sticks in mind for me was the 2017 Jerusalem Embassy protest. And the usual suspects were there, the U.S. Council for Muslim Organizations and CARE and ICNA and all of these guys. But the primary organizers were actually state Turkish media entities. They were the ones who pulled the permits. They were the ones that organized the, the funding and did all the scheduling and did all the busing and arranged for, for, for the work to happen. And so I found that a, a very telling a moment. And then on, and so the question is, where in the future will that go? Um, because I've noticed any time you have this pendulum or this spectrum, any time it goes really far in one direction, there's a reaction from certain elements within the Islamist community. Uh, you know, you saw this sort of at the height of, of uh, ISIS, where ISIS uh, magazines were openly mocking Nihad Awad and the Muslim Brotherhood as agents of the West and agents of, of, US, of US power. 
So there's always a tension in the community. And, and when things start to trend in a certain way, you do see an internal reaction to that. And then on the, the question of, of sort of polarity or right and left, uh, you know, some of us are old enough in this business to remember when Islamist groups very aggressively targeted uh, Republicans, very aggressively targeted, you know, George W. Bush. You had the, the Sami Al Aryan and uh, Al Amudi effort to um, dispatch with the use of secret evidence for immigration trials. Uh, but as the global war on terror went on, conservatives in general became more and more oppositional to Islamist efforts. They always had some favorite Republican actors, but for the most part, um, for the most part, you see them move increasingly to the left. Uh, the left is rejecting the war on terror. They're obviously very pro-open immigration. And you, you start to see an alignment of Islamist activity on issues that really have not much to do with Islamism. I'm thinking of the presence of somebody like Linda Sarsour at the Women's March, or when Nihad Awad describes Black Lives Matter as our matter. And so they, they you, and you start to see them get involved in, in these sort of left-wing issues that, I would, that one would think traditionally Islamist ideology would prohibit them from getting involved in, you know, allying with LGBT groups, these kinds of things. So the question is, to what extent are they influencing the left and to what extent are they being influenced by the left? And I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a question we should, we should try to figure out. And then what are the reactions to that reality? What elements within Islamism are reacting to this red-green alliance and saying, are we getting everything out of this alliance that we wanted to get? Um, so I would, I would posit that as a question. But you, know, you see sort of on, on the right-left spectrum, I, I would put as an, another high point, uh, sort of similar to the Jerusalem embassy protest, was the Sheikh Jarrah uh, protest in 2021 which in the US was predominantly led by the Palestinian Youth Movement, which is a pro-PFLP, uh, far more Marxist-Leninist than traditional Islamist movement. And CARE and, and uh, American Muslims for Palestine were there, they were present, but they were letting these younger, far more left-wing activists play the center role. And the language that the Palestinian Youth Movement was using in talking about Sheikh Jarrah was completely in alignment with the kind of language you see from you know, anarcho-communist groups protesting in Portland and Seattle. And in fact, you saw those types of groups retweeting and supporting that, that Palestinian youth movement message. So um, you know, trying to figure out where the Islamist movement is on that spectrum, where the resistance is, is coming from, where they will go next. Those are the questions I have. I, I'm really interested to hear what, what Abba and Sam have to say uh, to answer those questions. Um. So from the sound of it, you're saying um, the ideological confusion that we feel looking at this huge array of, of Islamist networks and organizations is felt by the Islamists themselves in, in, the, in the face of uh, increasing dissent and division uh, with it. So, I, I think um, for those who have followed Middle East Forum webinars, you might have seen our interview with um, Daniel Hakakachu, pretty uh, extreme Salafi-leaning cleric, who spends his days not going after Jews or, or Hindus, but after care and after Ilan Omar and after groups that we would have been mostly focusing on a few years ago as the predominant face of Islamism in the West. He goes after them because he believes they've diluted Islam. They've sold out uh, because of their alliances with the left. They've somehow made Islam and transgenderism work, which to him is the ultimate bidah innovation. It's the ultimate betrayal of true Islamic values. So as counter-Islamists, I mean, Kyle, how do you think we should best deal with this division? Should we sit back and let it happen? Should we pick a side? Should we go after all of them? What role should we play given that we want everyone to lose here, ultimately, right? Right. I mean, I, I, I go back to thinking about, over the past decades, the amount of column inches, the amount of money, the amount of seminars that took place 
within counter-Islamism trying to ask the question, how do we get the left to abandon Islamists over their treatment of, of gays and women? And as far as I can tell, there was no way. It was not going to happen. The left was not going to abandon uh, the Islamists. And in fact, what seems to have happened is increasingly the, the Islamists are willing to, or at least a subsection of them, are willing to tolerate the left's position on that issue to the point which I saw a poll that said 20, uh, two thirds of American Muslims support gay marriage, which I would think if I was, you know, if I was in a Kwani uh, of 1970, I would consider it a complete failure. Uh, but they don't seem to consider it a failure today. So in terms of you know, how do we, I think we have to be very careful in thinking about what the interests of the, all these different groups actually are. What are they trying to actually achieve? And how, can we actually push the left away from Islamists or can we actually push Islamists away from the left? Or is the transactional nature of that relationship so valuable to them that they'll, there's no ideological button you can push to make it stop. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm interested in the approach of getting them to fight each other. I know that's, that's something you've talked about in the past. Um, one of the things I like most about that approach is when a ideological movement is fighting amongst themselves, you learn a lot. Uh, you learn a lot about the internal dynamics of a group when they're airing each other's dirty laundry in public. Uh, so for, for that reason alone, I think it's worth doing. I don't know if strategically it will give you, you know, if, if there is a point where, you know, the modern left will abandon Rashida Tlaib, I'm inclined to think there's not. But that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Yeah. Now, for all this division, um, there are some issues where I think Islamists across the board are still somewhat united. And one of those, I guess, is, is the question of Israel. But the mm -hmm. other, as, as Abba, mm -hmm. you have so uh, clearly put forth, is, is India as well. This, yes. this interesting shift in mm -hmm. attention from, well, two questions. One, is it a shift in attention or is it an expansion? Is India now part of the equation as is Israel or have, have Islamists moved away from Israel to focus on, on India. And second, who exactly is behind this? Is this a coordinated campaign? How mm -hmm. did this come about? Uh, is this pushed by foreign states? Um, what is the impetus for all of this? Right. So, um, Sam, uh, the, the thing is that, you know, with, the, with, these, uh, with these groups, uh, what was your question again? I'm sorry, I missed it. Well, uh, two, two questions. Mm -hmm. One, um, uh, has it been a shift, shift of attention uh, or an no, expansion? No, so, so it's, it's uh, definitely not a shift. It's an expansion in their target base. And in fact, the attacks against Israel have actually gotten worse. Um, uh, Kyle mentioned the 2021 Gaza war. And uh, there were anti-Israel rallies across the country. And we were monitoring you know, some of the rhetoric coming out from these rallies. And uh, the, the anti-Semitic, hateful uh, rhetoric that was coming out corresponded with the high surge in anti-Semitic attacks, violent attacks against Jews, including uh, in New York and LA. And uh, we also... Uh, noted in our um, findings from these rallies that some elements from these rallies actually peeled off from the rallies and actually went after Jews in New York and uh, LA and uh, basically kind of, uh, you know, violently assaulting them. And at the same time, they were using slogans like kill all the Jews, free Palestine. So these rallies definitely played a very crit critical role in even radicalizing the Muslim Palestine, Palestinian population even more. So definitely there has been an expansion uh, of their target base. And uh, Israel is getting it really bad. Um, and India, of course, is the new target. And what was your second question? Who are the groups behind this? Are we talking about the extant Muslim Brotherhood organizations? Yes. Are we talking other networks, foreign state involvement? Who has pushed India into mm -hmm. the sights of, of American Islamists? Right. So um, there were certain actions that the Modi government, which is the ruling government in India, 
uh, which they took in uh, 2019, which was um, repeal of Article 370, which kind of integrated uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and that was a legal move to the rest of India. And then there was, uh, I mentioned earlier, the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, and all of these actions were kind of falsely represented as kind of targeting Indian Muslims. And um, so it was, you know, the Modi government's actions which kind of triggered this kind of reaction even among the Western uh, Islamist groups. And uh, already uh, the South Asian uh, Islamist groups have had a very long and active presence in the United States. And uh, we can see it from jamaat islamic groups, such as the Islamic Circle of North America, which work very closely with the Muslim Brotherhood groups, such as CARE and MASS, and they have their annual you know, conventions. And in the end, it's all about the Muslim Ummah. So whether it's Palestine or whether it's Kashmir, it's all about the establishment of you know, a universal caliphate, making Islam supreme. Uh, so all these uh, issues are very closely kind of tied to each other. And the key players, of course, uh, in the United States were CARE, uh, which was behind a number of the anti-India resolutions as well. And uh, there's uh, the Indian American Muslim Council, uh, which has come out of the Jamaat Islami, uh, the ICNA group. And, uh, and AMP as well, which is actually American Muslims for Palestine, but they've hosted also anti-India events. So there's a lot of overlap uh, among the groups. And as I said, it's all for the cause of the Muslim Ummah. And uh, these issues cannot be really differentiated from each other. But a group called American Muslims for Palestine, their focus is pretty clear from the name. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there are plenty of other Islamist causes, the, the Uyghurs in China, for right. example. So why, for the AMP, this you know, fa Hamas-founded organization, why, why do you think Kashmir was so so key to them. Do you think this is all about Modi or was so, there something so Sam, else? So uh, Sam, as I mentioned, it's all about the Muslim Ummah. And these issues are very kind of closely connected with, he, with each other. And also, um, you know, we, we spoke about building broad-based alliances. So uh, when, uh, when you talk about, you know, Palestine, you expect the other person to talk about Kashmir. So it's all kind of, you know, integrated. And uh, they've built these alliances to amplify their voice. And um, as far as, you know, the left uh, activist groups and the progressive groups are concerned, I think these alliances are basically a matter of expediency. So they've kind of pushed aside their differences on maybe women's rights and uh, LGBTQ. And uh, basically, they have a common hatred for democracies, for uh, American capitalism, American, uh, which they call uh, American imperialism, and uh, democracies such as Israel and India. So basically, it's to destroy these economies, uh, uh, to destroy these democracies and societies. So uh, it's it's only like um, um, what you call alliance of convenience for the time. Okay. So dissent in some areas, uh, coordination in others. Um, let's turn to some audience questions because uh, I'm keen we get through as many as uh, possible. Um, one question we have here um, is how have Islamists been so effective in getting their young activists or advocates into government institutions and positions of influence across the US? Kyle, this is a huge question and I think uh, I think, you know, our, the MEF's Islamism in Politics project has spoken with you and, and worked with CSP on multiple occasions to discuss this, this very issue. Tell us about Islamism in politics and tell us what you imagine the extent of Islamism in politics in a few years, say 10 years, might look like. Well, I would start off by saying that they're able to successfully, you know, infiltrate these people into, into elements of government because they try to. Uh, they make a concentrated effort to do that. Um, most normal people do not approach politics the way Islam, Islamists approach politics. But they, they approach politics as a conflict and they seek to win it. So they understand if they don't have access, if they don't have somebody on the inside, then they need to create that effort. So you saw them build, they built institutions. I like to say, you know, an is, Islamist will never buy lumber to build a building. They'll create a timber company. Uh, to, to, do, to, to do all of that, right? They, they'll create a union of Muslim carpenters. 
they build institutions to create the tools that they need. So when they realized that they needed people in politics, uh, of course, they for a long time had been giving money uh, to all kinds of politicians, but they built the institutions to find candidates, train them on how to run, how to fund, how to fundraise, and then they, they supported those through, through groups like Jetpack and so, and so forth. Um, so the answer is, how, you know, how did they infiltrate politics? They, they, made an, they, they made an accomplished effort at it, and they did it. So if we're approaching it, we need to think about it in the same way. What, what institutions do we not have now as counter-Islamists that we need to build? Or if we don't have people to staff those institutions, what institutions do we need to create as counter-Islamists to create the people that we need uh, to, to staff those jobs? And I'm think, thinking back to what Victoria and Wynn were talking about, you know, in terms of where do we find recruits who understand the Middle East in the right way, and those kinds of things. But yeah, if you don't approach politics in this, in this way, uh, as unpleasant as it is for, for those of us who live in democracy and, and want to vote you know, once every four years and then go to sleep, um, you lose out to ideologically committed movements like, like, uh, like this. Okay, Abba, um, we have a question here about care. Um, and you know, the investigative project on terrorism has studied care. It, I think it knows the group better than anyone. Um, is care preparing a new generation of leaders? And do you think this new generation is less dangerous ideologically than they used to be or, or, or not? And perhaps as you answer this, take into account, I think what, as Kyle was talking, this growing despair among other Islamists at care's perceived dilution and you know, moderation, for want of a better word, in recent years. Uh, so absolutely, care is, um grooming a new generation of leaders. Um, and they've been doing it for a long time. They have these Muslim advocacy days uh, that they sponsor uh, very regularly. And uh, recently I came across a care press release in which uh, they had announced this initiative. It's called Power Up to, um, to invite um, Muslim leaders from within the community who have leadership skills and are kind of interested in public service uh, to kind of um, get into this program and uh, they will then get the opportunity to meet with uh, politicians, to visit the White House. So this is definitely a way they groom uh, the young people into politics. And their agenda has been very clear for a very long time. You go back to 1998, you go back to the interview uh, of Omar Ahmad, who was the co-founder of uh, CARE, and he was, of course, the president of Islamic Association for uh, Palestine, which was part of a former Hamas support network in the United States. And he said very clearly, the goal of Islam in America is not to be equal to the other faiths. It's to be the predominant faith. And uh, Nihad Awad, just in 2019, he said at a care banquet, um, he said, we need to increase uh, the number of Muslims in politics. And uh, he said, we need at least 30 more congressmen in politics uh, by, say, 2030. So, so they, they're very clear and about their goal, and that is to, of course, uh, Islamize you know, the society and uh, make Islam supreme here. Fascinating. Um, we've had a question about contrasting Islamism and Europe and the US. I feel that could be a panel all on its own. Uh, Kyle, would you like to give this a go uh, in a sort of uh, in a summarizing way? In terms of the futures of Islamism as a threat in the US versus Europe, obviously the context is rather different. You have demographic questions, especially in England and France, um, that the US doesn't have. But the US still has a threat of its, of its own sort. Um, I think we've discussed the matter of the, the threat in terms of Islamism in politics and other forms already. How do, you see, how do you see Islamism in these two different continents diverging or coordinating over the next decade or so? I uh, would hate to steal your thunder, Sam, because I know you know the Europeans a lot better than I do. Um, but I think that, that, I mean, especially the demographic question is so key because it, I think it allows Islamists in Europe to be more uncompromising. 
they don't have to give in on some of these left-wing issues that I talked about, even though they, they are in and even dominate some of these left-wing political parties or uh, in, in some countries like you know, Belgium and what have you, where they have a really uh, strong demographic influence. So they can, they can afford to be more uncompromising, um, which does sort of create ideological differences. Um, you also have, I think, in the, the networks in Europe, I've heard that you know the Muslim Brotherhood is still much stronger in places like France and Belgium than they are here and, and in the UK, um, where they, maybe they didn't take as much damage from the fallout of the Arab Spring um, politically. Um, so I think that's a place where we may see uh, some divergence. Uh, but I think that the demographic question and the, the uncompromising nature of European Islamism is, is, uh, is, is irrelevant, is, is, is probably the most relevant factor. Interesting. Now, the one question we had was on the, the Islamist connection with far-right groups. And, and Europe, of course, is a, quite an interesting place for that to happen because we're seeing a growing familiarity between far-right activists and Islamists uh, in Europe, especially in places like France, uh, but also uh, across the board, I think, you might remember a few years ago, um, a number of, of, and I use far right um, in, in the sense of, of folks who, who are genuine neo-Nazis, uh, but we've seen, we've seen a number of instances of, of far right individuals trying to work with Hamas in the US. Um, uh, far right, there was huge um, acclaim within neo-Nazi circles in the US for the, when the Taliban took over Kabul. And as um, uh, we have written about um, uh, at Focus on Western Islamism, and as Ismail Roya was somewhat hinting at yesterday, there is a growing admiration among some circles of conservatives for the conservatism of Islam. There's a mutual admiration for the uncompromising stance on, say, issues such as abortion or a discomfort with things like the gay rights. Act, uh, uh, activism and, and so on. So we are, we are beginning to see levels of collaboration. Um, I do recommend you read the uh, uh, Focus on Western Islamism essay that we published because we delve into this topic quite deeply. But Abba, I, I did very quickly want to ask you, is this something that the investigative project on terrorism has come across uh, in, in your study of violent Islamism, or, or, or indeed nonviolent, but a growing familiarity between far-right interests and Islamist ones? Not that I've noticed, Sam, um, to be very honest with you. In the groups that we focus on, we haven't seen this collaboration with the far right. No. So if this is happening, this might be at a very early stage. It might go nowhere. Probably. Um, something to watch. Uh, yeah. I, th I think part of it, too, if I may, is the recognition, particularly in Europe, but also in the United States, that Islamists were allowed to say things that others weren't. There is sort of a sort of a cheeky far right meme of, you know, Islam is right about women is, is the meme. And the, the trick here, of course, is you're either forced to admit that Islam has thoughts about uh, women's rights, which are maybe not in line with uh, Western standards, uh, or you have, so you're either, you're either forced to say something not pro women or not pro Islam, and it makes people very uncomfortable. So. The notion, the recognition among certain elements, I think, of the far right that the Islamists were, they got away with saying things that nobody else could say. And that is sort of the, the danger of, of giving Islamists that free reign that they, that they got in Europe and, and increasingly get in the United States to say things that, you know, otherwise would be considered, you know, politically improper, is it does create that sense that this is a favored class. And you know, maybe the only way to advance my political interests is to be a member of a favored class. And if Islam is, a, is, is that favored class, then maybe I should join it. I remember a, a joke that Mark Stein used to tell about a white supremacist who became an Islamist. And he said, you know, he said he was a white supremacist, but it turns out when he was forced to make a choice, it was the supremacy party he really liked. And, and so I, you know, I think there's, a, you know, there's an element of that when you create that, that protection to say certain things for a certain class, then you empower that class, and that's what we've seen. So Sam, I just wanted to interject, you know, just uh, based on uh, Kyle's comments. So we have seen cases of an overlap between neo-Nazis and Islamism. So uh, there was this very interesting case of uh, um, a US, uh, 
you know, transit cop, and he was, um, um, he was uh, prosecuted for having supported uh, ISIS, for material support for, uh, to ISIS. And he also was a neo-Nazi. And there are many other cases that we've come across. So there is this overlap between neo-Nazis and uh, Islamism, which is kind of a very interesting connection for, uh, for us to kind of pursue further. Absolutely. Um, Abbott, there's another question here about India, and, or, or rather the effect on Hindus here in the US. Mm -hmm. um, we see outbreaks of sectarian violence between Muslims and Hindus in India. The questioner writes, how pervasive is Islamist agitation against Hindus here in North America? So, um, of course, uh, India has been facing this religious strife between Hindus and Muslims for a really long time. And uh, the Islamists have been kind of misrepresenting um, the facts and kind of painting it as a one-sided Hindu aggression. Uh, but when it comes to diaspora communities, I think this whole uh, targeting of Hindutva as a Nazi ideology, as a fascist ideology, that has been having uh, repercussions on diaspora communities. We saw the violence in Leicester, um, and then, of course, over here also, rising Hindu phobia. Uh, temples are being attacked. Hindus are being targeted. So definitely this kind of uh, anti-Hindu hate is uh, having an impact on the Hindu community. OK. Are there any moderate groups we can work with? Um, I think this question must have been asked in every single counter Islamism event I've ever done. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's worth asking every time, because the, que the answer does change over time. And the number of, of Muslim allies we can rely on changes over time and has never been particularly big. So uh, Abha, starting with you, are there Muslim allies that IPT has? Um, are there Muslim groups and networks with which we should be working, but we have not yet taken advantage? So the ones that come to mind is, of course, uh, Zudi Jasser and his AFI. A FID, and then of course uh, there's Asra Numani as well, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other Muslim reformers. And uh, we need to definitely collaborate more with them and uh, to empower them, which is uh, very important. And yesterday, uh, Dr. Pipes in his presentation spoke about empowering people like Basimid and uh, uh, Khalid Abu Tuame. So uh, I think there is a need to you know empower the moderates and. Um, I, I also see that, uh, and I have seen that uh, within the Indian context, I see a lot of very young people, young Muslims, uh, who, who kind of uh, are not uh, radically identify with uh, the Indian civilization, with the Indic civilization. And uh, that is like a, a section that one should tap into and empower those people. And uh, even uh, Dr. Pipes in his presentation spoke about a large number of Palestinians and Muslims who are pro-Israel, and they should be empowered as well. So uh, there are a lot of people out there that uh, we can reach out to and work with and platform them. And uh, I think uh, that would uh, help kind of counter to some degree the threat from radical Islam. Kyle, what do, you, what do you think? Well, Sam, as you know, the last time I saw Sam, we were in Austria uh, at a meeting of the Clarity Coalition, which is a new coalition of, of both uh, former Muslims and, and, and Muslim moderates, um, and that it was sponsored by the Jan Hirsi Ali Foundation. And the thing that I found most heartening at that group was we had conversation for the first time, really, uh, between both um, former Muslims who are politically progressive atheists and folks like Zudi Jasser who are politically conservative, still identify as, as practicing, pra practicing Muslims and so on. And they were able to cooperate and talk about further cooperation in a way that I found really uh, positive. Uh, on the negative side, they were all the peop same people that we've, we've known for 20 years. And they're all great people and I'm glad that they exist. Uh, but I wish that there was a larger population than there was. Um, but we have to make do with um, the population that exists. And, but I think that, that cross-cooperation where counter-Islamists of whether they're classically liberal or they're on the left or they're on the right uh, was taking place in a, in, a, in a manner of collegiality, I think that was a very positive 
uh, positive state. So I, I will just add one very quick thing to this, which is that one of the things the Middle East Forum has been, has been doing for a few years uh, is trying to map Western Islam because Islam and thus Islamism is exceptionally diverse and it's not just a few groups and movements, it's hundreds and hundreds of different movements delineated by ethnicity, by school of jurisprudence, by culture, by uh, uh, various schools of theology. It's enormous and um, there are plenty of small moderate groups uh, perhaps we could work with, we could reach out to. Uh, their influence is often questionable, but one thoroughly untapped idea that has emerged as a result of this mapping work is we've been able to see the layout of the, of the almost 8,000 Islamic institutions across the US is the enormous African-American Islamic community here in the United States. Um, for years, uh, we've ignored this community, partly because we think of much of it being Nation of Islam or having joined the Salafis or even joined the Shia uh, Iranian mosques at some point. But the truth is there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of black mosques across this country that follow no political ideal and follow a very, very rudimentary form of, of Islam that is thoroughly apolitical. Um, something we're exploring is reaching out to these communities. And this is something we wouldn't have thought to do a few years ago because we didn't know they existed. Uh, but my, uh, my own two cents is, is I think there are moderate Muslims out there. I think Islamists have made damn sure we didn't know about them by commandeering this community and keeping the moderates at, uh, at arm's length for many, for many decades. Um, I feel we're uh, pretty much out of time. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for listening to this panel. I'd like to turn over to Greg Roman. Thank you.